Okay, it is recording. So welcome everyone. This is our first research um, seminar uh, from Crypto Econ Lab. Um, so just to give a quick overview, the goal here is for our team to present um, interesting topics they have been working on or research papers they have been reading and they want to share. Um, and we have a rota. So every month there's a specific researcher that is planned to present. And if you want to know more about uh, the next uh, sessions and see the notes and recordings from previous sessions, you can go to the dedicated um, page. Um, and with this, I'll kick off. So we have Axel is our first ever uh, researcher presenting, and he'll be talking about how crypto economics is not statistical physics. Um, you can go, Axel. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Uh, yeah, and thanks for organizing this. I think this is a really great uh, initiative. We should do more. Uh, yeah, so just uh, let me just start with a little like preamble of what this is in relation to what you said. So like. I think uh, us at CryptoCon Lab, we're most of the time doing like very urgent questions that are relevant to Falcoin and all of this. So this is kind of a set of ideas that I've had just in the back burner for a while. And these are more like uh, theoretical wondering. So I, I don't know that this will yet uh, have a, a, like a productizable application to Falcoin in the near future or something, but just a set of, uh, I mean, we are research scientists and are allowed to think of interesting things, I think. Yeah. Uh, and disclaimer that in my previous life, I was a statistical physics physicist. And uh, yeah, this is why this is the kind of thing I... Yeah, so, so this has kind of been a, a personal game this way because what I know is statistical physics. And the first intuition is like, oh, wait, is this... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm now doing crypto economics. Is crypto economics statistical physics? No. That's the end of my talk. No. Uh, right. So yeah. So so just like this exploration of like uh, okay. So the things that that a statistical physics would know and would like to do. How is it different? And what does it have to do or not? So what kind of what what uh, I, yeah. what what the 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 name that I can give that includes both of these subjects as I can call like these two areas like complex many bodies or many agent or many whatever systems, right? And uh, this is uh, to me a, a vaguely defined uh, set of subjects that with a unifying team that you have many, right? Of whatever you have. And uh, having many is different than having few, right? So these are, uh, and yeah, so there's all sorts of things can be like that. So this is like particle collisions in an accelerator. So this is like subatomic particles. So you can have like molecules in a, in some material that are interact. So interacting set of many that can do something that an interacting set of few perhaps cannot. So you can have like bacteria forming colonies and uh, some emergent patterns, or things like having a a, a wave emerge at a, in a football stadium or something. Right? Uh, so, our, so all of these are kind of encapsulated in, in this name, but statistical physics and basically which helps describes these two pretty well stands in a different place in that it's a very rigor rigorous field with a lot of understanding and a lot of results, which is kind of a contrast with what is here, which is like hacking away at these problems, trying to figure out what we can, but there's not like a like a theory of what these things are are doing, uh, right? And in particular, there's a theory of of like there's a very good understanding of the theory of phase transitions and connected uh, critical phenomena. So this is kind of what I mean by this. Let's take one example of like a magnet. So this is so how magnets work are that you have your magnet is made of little magnets, right? So uh, so the 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 molecules in, in your magnetic material are like little magnets themselves, which they have a little arrow, right? Which is like the direction of, uh, right, of their kind of their, their spin, we call it. So this, uh, this magnetic uh, uh, variable that they have. And they are interacting with their closest neighbors the most, right? So this one has a strong interaction with this one, much smaller interaction with this one and with this one and so on. 
but out of these little interactions that they could have, this uh, this uh, uh, this little magnets could end up align aligning, and you have your uh, magnetized face, right? So where all the man all the little magnets are now pointing in one direction, in this magnetized face, now you have a whole piece of metal that is magnetized and it's a big magnetic field. Now, if you start to heat this up, it can become the fluctuations are enough that it can become demagnetized if it passes this critical temperature where it demagnetizes. Right? So, so at some point, as I, so, so you start some of these stars fluctuating, but still the alignment is strong. But at some point, these fluctuations start becoming very large, and in the end, you have something that is no longer ordered in this way. So there's a word that will come up also. So this is an ordered phase and a disordered phase. And so there's, and I'll elaborate a bit more on that. And there's a couple of things that 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 define like uh, critical phenomena in the statistical physics. So one thing is that all this theory and very strong understanding that we have is only about equilibrium, right? So I can't really tell you about how to turn this into this. The best uh, uh, we, we usually like uh, appeal to is like adiabatic principle that if we do this close enough, uh, if we do this change slow enough, it should be roughly like at any instant we are in some equilibrium kind of thing. Yeah. But but we understand these things only like in a static non-equilibrium kind of thing. So at this moment this is uh, order and this is disorder, but we don't understand kind of movement from one to the other. Right? Yeah, I mean, in a very rigorous way. Uh, another defining aspect is like you have diverging correlation lengths close to critical point. And at the critical point, uh, you get a uh, scale invariance, right? So what this means in this example is that, so when I introduce fluctuations to this one, this starts looking like little bubbles of, so like, let's say if the correlation length is around uh, three spins, or so maybe like a set of three spins here can, can fluctuate together and uh, so, so you have little bubbles of non-order happening. The more I increase the temperature getting closer to this uh, critical point, these fluctuations can get arbitrarily large, right? So you get fluctuations of all length scales. Right? And at the critical point, what happens is that there's fluctuations of completely any size and you get like scale invariant phenomenon. Like whether you look at a small circle here is kind of the same thing as if you look at a big circle here. And this is an extremely powerful tool, too powerful in that it's very tempting to try to apply it to other things where we don't know that it applies. And that's uh, one thing that, that I'll touch on. Uh, connected to this, and I'll show you how is that uh, if you have a, a scale invariant critical theory, then you can characterize it by a set of critical exponents, which is a very powerful tool to like classify different systems and understand them very well. Another point is that, so these transitions as I described generally happen between some ordered and disordered phase. So it's about, about, uh, right, so, so about destroying some, about basically fluctuations, destroying some order that was in some lower phase and, and so on. And another, uh, uh, another important thing which I want touch much on is that generally you can talk about end order phase transitions which is like there's some discontinuity in something right so you re remember this from like uh, school that uh, right so you're increasing the temperature and uh, uh, so let's say you want to melt ice and uh, so you're putting more heat in it and when you reach the melting point it doesn't start raising the temperature right after that, but there's a discontinuity where you keep putting more energy, but you're not raising the temperature because you're melting the ice. Right? So, so it's a discontinuity and with what your input and these outputs are like, it used to be that temperature is rising with the heat, but at this point, there's a discontinuity that it stops doing that. But, and that can happen at end order and so on. Let me see if there was a, I can't really see the chats. I don't know if uh, anyone, I encourage people to ask me a question instead of writing because I'm not gonna read. Uh, all right, so here is a yeah a bit more quantifying what what these things mean. So ordered phase uh, means that there is some observable, some local observable that I can look at. So I can put my little magnet reader here or my little thermometer here or something, 
at some point. So local means that that is I put it at some point here denoted by by i. So at this point, and the expected value of that quantity will be non-zero. Uh, even though so I'll get to, to be to this later. Like uh, uh, so, this is kind of an emergent order. Like by looking at the starting equations that I'll show you, you wouldn't expect this to be different than zero because things are symmetric. But in this order phase, you get some non-zero quantity. Uh, and in the disordered phase, that has an expected value of zero. So in this case, you can understand this as like, what is the expected value of a given magnetization uh, here, of a given one arrow here? If I probe it here, I expect that it will be plus one in this direction. That will be the, my expected value. While here, it will be zero because it can be in this direction, it can be in any direction, it's disorganized. Right? So there, there's a, so this is called an order parameter. It's a local thing that you can measure that is zero in one phase and non-zero in the other. So phase transitions are characterized by order parameter in this way. And at the critical point, this is the thing I was saying about, uh, about critical exponents. So basically, since you have something that is scale invariant, and you wanna talk about correlation functions on this scale invariant thing. So you can say, what is my correlation function between spin i and spin j? Whatever function I have here has to be something that doesn't, that is scale invariant, that doesn't have like uh, scale parameters in it. And basically the only thing I can write down is some kind of polynomial like this. So it couldn't be like an exponential decay. It can't be a sign or whatever. It can only be power loss, right? So, so in the critical phenomena, everyone's always talking about power loss and so on. And once I simplify it like this, you see like understanding correlation functions, is just a thing about knowing what am I set, set of critical exponents here is this delta and kind of this uh, structure constants, whatever these are called. So it's like, if I understand a small set of numbers, I understand my theory of what's happening in this uh, critical point, which is extremely powerful. Uh, uh, so this leads to to like a lot of phenomenology in other areas that are not this well defined and like a lot of publications like look I found some, something that looks like a power law of something here this must be a critical phenomena even though I'm talking about uh, uh, the wave in a stadium or whatever right so so th so, so there's a lot of uh, of uh, like uh, of power law hunting out there in the world of many body systems that are not necessarily equilibrium statistical physics where it's not even clear what is if this is a it's not clear this is a sign of criticality in general or even if criticality is well defined which is kind of the question i'm i'm going at here so what is statistical physics a bit of, of a background and the, yeah, the joys of the easing model so uh so the easing model is a nice uh nice thing that uh, statistical physics is, is like to play with because it showcases all these ideas in a simple computable manner so it looks like this is a model for for something like the magnet i described but one simplification is that the sp the spin variable these arrows can only be like either up or down so they cannot be uh in any direction so either up or down and um, right, so in statistical physics you have an energy function so like I have a configuration of what all the spins were they're pointing at some moment, and I can calculate what is the energy of that configuration. And this is the kind of the energy function that, that describes that. What this describes here is that uh, if a spin aligns with its nearest neighbor, that is good, like that's lower the energy, that is a lower energy state. And uh, right, so this is kind of the interaction between nearest neighbors. Here I wrote like, nearest neighbor with this like set of one, because I mean like nearest neighbors in all directions, right? So in X axis and Y axis or whatever nearest neighbors you have. And here you could also add, this is an external magnetic field, right? So I could, so this is a term that encourages neighbors to align with each other. And from that, right, that can lead to this kind of order. But I can also like push it externally by putting an external magnetic field that all the spins want to align in the direction of J. Uh, that, so that's the, the easy model here. So, uh, 
Right, so after you define your energy function, the next next thing you can do is like you define a partition function, right? So, uh, so you basically sum over all possible configurations of spins weighted with this uh, Boltzmann weight here. So, so it's just the energy function with your temperature. And this is the definition of temperature. This is what temperature is. Uh, so, so temperature tells you like how much to weight each configuration. Right. And then you have expectation value. So if I want to look at some observable, I calculate its average over all possible configurations with this weight. Right. So that's statistical physics. That's what I'm talking about, equilibrium statistical physics, right. which you, you describe by some given temperature. Uh, Just to make the comment, if you go back to the previous slide, yeah. if you think of it in terms of probability, not the, the dimension. Yeah. Yeah. You think of it in terms of probability of observing a given configuration, uh, this Z is the normalization constant of this yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, give like uh, probability distribution e to the negative h over t. Yeah. 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 So see, in this case, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a. Uh, it has a bit fewer util more utilities than this. Like it can also work like as a generating function for some things, but uh, we can think of it now as a normalization constant. Uh, okay. Uh, right. Yeah. So, right, so that's uh, so uh, so that's a kind of the definition of statistical mechanics. But one one way to kind of go about it and uh, like uh, understand this a bit more is uh, so you can think of low temperature ex uh, expansions, right? So in this case, so what you see here is that uh, so at low temperatures, uh, states. Uh, so configurations that are very low energy are like the most important and then configurations with higher and higher energy are more weighted down right so this is an exam uh, an expansion that is about looking at the ground state of the model which is basically the lowest possible energy configuration and then adding thermal fluctuations around that right? uh, what this kind of looks like, so, so if I look, let me first look at without including this external field. So I'm just looking at this interaction. This model with this, two inter with this interaction has two ground states, right? So one is that all the, uh, the energy is minimized by having all the spins, all, all the variables align up or all the variables align one, right? So either plus one or minus one here. Right? Uh, uh, so this is kind of an effective, so I won't go into how this is generated, but it's kind of like a, a, an effective potential of like, uh, if I look at a given uh, spin there, so, so like where the, uh, what, what direction of that uh, spin contributes the most energy, right? So basically it has two ground states here where the spins are expected to align here at plus one, or they could align here at, at minus one. And going away from this uh, uh, from these uh, points, like you can do it by right, by adding some more energy or so on. And now, so so okay. So let's say I I have this field and uh, this uh, this this uh, these two ground states, and I am in the I remove all fluctuations. Basically, I I can start my expansion by by going to one of these two ground state. So it has two equivalent ground states. So this is the concept of what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? which is that this energy function here is completely symmetric in plus or minus one. But if I want to do a low temperature expansion, the starting state I have to choose is one that breaks the symmetry. So I have to choose either start from plus one or minus one. Right? So, so, uh, right, so it's, so it's, so you can also think of this as so spontaneous entity breaking and emergent order are kind of equivalent things. So, right, so, so this was first indifferent between plus and minus one, but the ground state you have to choose, okay, now they're all aligned up. Right? And then I think about alignment, everyone up and fluctuations around them. Uh, so that's spontaneous symmetry breaking. And you can also talk about explicit symmetry breaking, which is for instance, if I add the external magnetic field, Let's say I add a little magnetic field pointing downwards, then that will bias this to be like a more real ground state than this one, yeah. the one where, where everyone is pointing down. Yeah. Uh, 
Right, so, so if I start at zero temperature, I will be in one of these ground states, say I'm here. And the question is, if I start introducing thermal fluctuations, will they be enough? So, so, so that will mean things will start getting higher and higher here. At some point, I will have enough, enough energy to kind of overcome this, uh, uh, right, this, this of having to, so I can move around between both uh, ground states, and that is the phase transition. Right? So that is restoring the symmetry through high enough fluctuations. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so, so these are kind of the questions. Now we understand statistical physics. Can we look for these kind of things in, uh, in economics, right? So can we look for things like spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, emergent order? Uh, can we think about symmetry, symmetry restoration through fluctuations, right? And having an order and disordered phase. Uh, can we uh, uh, yeah, can we talk about this same kind of thing of divergence of correlation lengths and uh, right so, and and yeah and even this would be the greatest if we can characterize things with critical exponents that would be uh, very powerful too uh, yeah the spoiler is that for for the specific kind of economic problem I'm looking at these two maybe these two no. Uh, which is interesting. Right? So, I mean, in the way that I define. It. Uh, okay, so what are we looking at here? So, what 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 economics are we looking at? So, so, so we're, we'll let's start by. I mean, just consider something simple, but something to start with, which is like uh, a one shot game with approximately rational players uh, that has some sense of locality, right? So, so one shot. I mean that uh, they have like every player has one strategy to decide this will be my strategy for the game i do this action and then see the outcome it's not a thing like so a two shot would be like i play once then see the outcome of this game and make my new strategy and play again so that would be a uh, so it's like make the strategy without knowing first and then that's the game is over and so uh okay. And uh, rational players, I, I assume, like they're trying to, to to optimize their utilities and so on, but perhaps no, not perfectly, and that's where the fluctuations will come in. It's like fluctuations around the not optimally optimizing, right? And some sense of locality, kind of to have, uh, so, so to be a, right. So this is where we, uh, I mean, so in this sense, uh, so here the locality I'm talking about is kind of, uh, so these pins are arranged in some space where there's an ocean of distance and which of these pins are closer to me and I interact more with the ones that are closer to me. The locality here doesn't need to be literal space as is in this case, but some other notion of distance and some notion of I interact more with players who are closer to me. Uh, so that can be very geographic or can be about the, uh, uh, internet speeds or whatever. So, so, so some notion of, of distance and more interaction with my vicinity. Uh, right, so, so what I have here is well, so I have a set of strategies of all the end players in the game and a set of utilities for each one of them. Right? So, so the utility for the eighth player depends on their own strategy and the strategies of the rest of the players, but mostly of, of their neighbors. Right? Uh, so that's why I call, so this is like the set of other strategies. So by bar I here, I mean like the rest of the ones that are not I. Um, this is like the set of everyone else who is in I. Um, but here is a kind of a vague label, but I gave that the ones closest to them are the most important. In this, uh, right? So this is the, the kind of, uh, of, of problem I'm looking at. Uh, Right, so kind of to understand what, what are the parallels I'm looking at between uh, what corresponds to what in uh, statistical physics and game theory. So, so kind of I wanna think about this expansion of we have a stable point like at zero temperature and we have the ground state here. And then we add fluctuations around it. Uh, so in statistical physics is we have the ground state as our start, starting stable point, And then we can add thermal fluctuations around that and or there's other like quantum type of fluctuations and other thing but not unrelated it's a similar idea uh, right so the analog version that I'm looking at here is that 
the kind of the stable points in these uh, games are the Nash equilibrium. I'll go a bit uh, more on that. Uh, right, so this is like what would be a stable point if everyone is completely rational. Right? So these are stable points for rational players. But adding some fluctuations around that by uh, what, I, what it's called, uh, give the reference someone called noise introspection, which is basically adding some kind of noise around completely rational strategies. Uh, all right, so a bit more on, uh, right, so what, what Nash equilibrium is, how we're using that. So, it's, so Nash equilibrium is, uh, right, so we have the strategy of the eighth player. The strategy that they they will choose is, the, actually it should be max, well, maxi max and the utility, but uh, anyway. Uh, Right, so, so it's the strategy that maximizes their utility, given that everyone else is also choosing the Nash equilibrium strategy. And what this means is, uh, so, so, if, uh, so, so it's a configuration of everyone doing something that one player alone cannot improve the situation for themselves, right? right so so if, if everyone is in this Nash equilibrium point, and this one person here is trying to improve their outcome. They won't be able to do it by themselves. This is the best they can do, unless some uh, uh, unless other people also change their, their strategies. Right? So it's a, so this is why it's kind of stable because it would require a kind of a larger scale change in strategy, not at the individual scale. Right? So, so the individual cannot do any better if everyone is doing the the Nash equilibrium. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. So, so it's kind of a distinction here that so this is kind of for like the optimal, the, the stable optimal situation for non-collaborative games because like this is the best I can do on my own. Uh, uh, kind of the best I can do is guess that probably everyone is thinking this and probably everyone will just go for the Nash strategy and then I can't do any better than the Nash strategy. But of course, if they were collaborating, things could be a lot better. Like you could like optimize the overall utility for everyone or something like this, if, if you can talk about the strategies and so on. Uh, right. So one key distinction here with statistical physics is that there's like n things to minimize or rather maximize here versus the one thing in statistical physics. So, so in statistical physics, you are minimizing the energy. Right? So there's this one energy function. So it's very similar, like you can talk about the, so, so statistical physics is rather a lot more similar to collaborative games. So you can define the total utility for everyone and maximize that. And that's very similar to the question here of minimizing the total energy. But here there are n things to, to minimize for just one thing. Uh, right, so this noisy introspection, and here's a nice reference to this. Kind of uh, uh, right, a way to model kind of noise around the Nash equilibrium. So let's say I'm I'm, I'm trying to do the the Nash equilibrium, but uh, but but have some noise around it, right? So uh, so the idea is uh, this this is a process that is done iteratively and like so so there's a lot of introspection. So the first layer is like if I assume everyone else is doing Nash what let me explore my the neighborhood of my possible strategies around this Nash equilibrium. And I do give, so my expected strategy here will be like a strategy that is weighted by the, the, the different, so this is weighted by my utility uh, around this point. And so, uh, right, so, uh, so this might actually be a, loss here because yes I have the min and max mixed up here but doesn't matter uh, anyway it, it's similar to, to to this kind of Boltzmann waiting for for statistical mechanics where I will the maximum weight will come from my maximum utility and then I'll get decreasing weights uh, uh, away from that and and so on uh, but 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 I'll, I'll I allow myself a more range of strategies weighted by probabilities and and, and so on now uh then i think on a second layer like okay i'm thinking this but the rest of the players may also be thinking this on, on their own so 
So I am allowing myself some randomness around Nash equilibrium, uh, but uh, I actually shouldn't have the word Nash here. So, but there's a second layer here where the strategies of everyone else are also determined probabilistically where they are themselves thinking about moving around Nash equilibrium. And so the, tar the, the strategies of the other players are chosen probabilistically with so we have we're defining this set of temperatures here where this is kind of the level of fluctuations I'll allow myself. This is the level of fluctuations I believe others will have. And then here, this one's also could be said this way by other. Oh, so this the other players may also be think, thinking that the other players will be probabilistic, so they will model things this way, and then those will think that and and so on. So everyone. So I'm not only probabilistic, but I know others will be probabilistic and I know they know that others will be probabilistic and so on. So you can do this like to the end level of introspection and then kind of the strategies taking this to, to infinity. And that's, 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 how, that, that's where this is going. And that is kind of a model for fluctuations around Nash equilibrium. Right? And this is characterized by a set of temperatures for for each level and uh, right, so this could be uh, I mean so yeah there's there's more thought to be had about these temperatures should they be all the same should they be so, so in this particular paper they actually argue for like these are like just like exponentially increasing or something in a sense that each level of introspection is more mysterious than the last, so it would have a higher temperature and uh, so on. So there's a, that's something they argue there, but I'm not arguing here. Uh, right. right, so as I was saying, so this is different from a cooperative game, which would be very much like statistical physics in a sense that, so, so we just have to maximize the total utility for everyone. So here I have kind of the, the sum of all utilities here or the product of all these Boltzmann weights. And we all maximize that together and uh, everyone wins by maximizing that, that one thing, right? Uh, uh, right, so, but then something like essential difference between this and this is that this cooperative model is actually interacting, right? So. So because you're cooperating, your strategy is actually interacting with the actual strategy that other players will have. So if I look at like correlation functions between strategies, I expect to see correlation lengths, right? So this, the correlation of this one here is correlated to this one here. And because of this locality that I talked about, I expect higher correlation between neighbors than uh, between uh, further uh, agents, right? So, uh, but this is something that comes about only if the strategies are actually interacting with the real strategies of the others. But this is not what is happening here. This is like the very interesting, very different point here that you still have interactions between strategies of neighbors, but they are not really interactions with what the neighbors are doing. They are interactions with what I think the neighbor will do. Uh, so, uh, right, so uh, kind of something you can, so, so the way you can kind of mathematically see this here is that if you wanna, like you're only interested in calculating things about this I strategy, with this probability distribution here, you can kind of integrate out every other strategy, right? So you can sum over all these possible, yeah, uh, JP has a hand. Yeah, sorry, I, I probably missed it, but um, <clears throat> what is the what is the concept of uh, of being of neighborhood in in this in this context? Uh, right. So it that comes in the so in the utility. So, so that's uh, a description of what the utilities look like. That uh, right. So so I assume there is some notion of distance, which doesn't have to be physical distance, but some notion of distance, and. You, uh, right, so your utility depends not only on what you do, but on what others do. But it will depend more on what your closest neighbors in this distance do. So this is that, that notion of, of locality. Um, okay, so it's not that everyone is neighbors, well, immediate no. neighbors with everyone, but there's uh, some sort of 
Yeah, that would be the opposite. Right? So, so that would be like no notion because like I can interact at any distance that's non-local, that's global. Right? But local means that I can really only interact with the closest people to me. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Right, so, so, so you can kind of mathematically understand this about the interactions in that. So I can kind of derive from this an effective uh, probability distribution if I am only interested in asking questions about this one strategy here. I can basically integrate out all other strategies. Right? So this is a sum over all strategies. I go ahead and perform the sum over all the other strategies. Now they're no longer variables. and. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, I actually not, not not maybe that's not what I wanted to say. But let's say I want let's say I want to calculate a, a correlation function here, where I have S i and S j. I can then integrate out everyone else than i and j, right? And then get a distribution here that describes uh, the relationship between i and j, right? But the point is that will produce something non-trivial something a distribution that is not just a product of something for, for si and a product for something for s uh, for sj it will produce something that is not uh, decomposable like that and therefore there will be some correlation right and that comes from like all the interactions in between i and j in this level i'm kind of doing all the integrating out here so 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 this introduces uh, th this has some information of what your neighbors would do, but not from what they're actually will do. Or, uh, so uh, yeah, so so I can integrate out. Uh, right, so let's do, do the same thing here. I have S I and S J. I integrate out everyone else, and uh, if you look at this close enough, you will uh, what you will have is a distribution for S I times a distribution for S J which means these two will be not correlated because this distribution is factorizable like this. Uh, and this, I find this very interesting. So, so uh, it's very interesting because, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't really have a parallel in, in normal statistical physics uh, in a sense that, so you, you can still talk about order because your, your, but your strategies are still aligned with neighbors but in the sense of what you think is good for them to do but you cannot talk you will not have correlations right so it is possible to talk about a critical phenomena in this uh in, in this kind of uh non-cooperative games where there is a change from order to disorder let's say but you should not be expecting to see uh scale invariance and talk about uh, uh, critical exponents and all that good stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's uh, pretty cool, right? So, so things that make, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm lacking, uh, I would like to have uh, simple prototypes of, of games to put where I can see uh, uh, all this phenomena happening, but what I have is what is, possible to look for and what will not happen right so it is possible that something like this happens i don't have an example yet that i'll show you here it happens but this is a reasonable question to ask which is kind of what we're talking about here so you could have a game where you have an ordered phase where as i, as I described so you have some observable that uh, right so some let's say some function of, of a local strategy here that for some small set of temperatures for some small level of fluctuations will be uh, non-zero, right? So, so, so some order parameter here that, that you have some expected value. But if I introduce high enough fluctuations, uh, you will uh, kind of lose that, that order, right? Uh, right? So things like, so what, what, what can these kind of things be? So, so let's say like, uh, uh, deals between clients and uh, storage providers or something like this so so there's a, an order there, there's uh, there's there's a possible equilibrium state where the optimal strategies are people to make these deals where where there's where, so you can look at the expected thing here is like the payment at this point in space where where for this client and this uh, storage provider interact and there is an expected non-zero payment because it has become an accepted and reasonable thing that 
people pay each other for for uh, right, for data storage or or whatever, right? Uh, but given enough noise of like people not just behaving rationally but doing whatever people do in the internet, it would not be expected. So the expected deal amount you would see between a random data holder and a data storer will be zero. So, so this, these are the kind of things uh, uh, I talk about. Uh, but uh, right, so, so you could have an ordered and disordered phase and a transition be between these two, even while not having this phenomena of uh, like strategies being uh, correlated. Right? And this is what I find very interesting uh, that this is an order that can emerge from what players think other players will do, but not from what they actually do. And this is something that I don't know, a parallel in uh, statistical physics, right? So, so you can't have order without correlation, but in this game, order can emerge from thinking, right? So, uh, so that's cool. Uh, and a, a little note here, right? So, so I've been talking about this kind of one-shot games and where the, what, uh, what players want to do is like there will be this short game we will play then the the game will end i evaluate all my winnings throughout the game and what i want is to have won the most by the end of the game right and this is kind of how these uh, nash strategies are, are are chosen like what will optimize what i will have won by the end of the game yeah. but you could also have that's not the only thing you might want to do so you might have like long games where you know there is a, an end to the game at some point and you will want to have one at the end of that but you also want to uh, survive for now right uh, so, uh, something comes to mind is like retirement right so you're working now and you hope by the end of uh, when you're 65 you will have a, a one with the most utility and can uh, and one that life but you also want to uh, survive now while you're working at 37. Uh, and then there's like a uh, 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 so there's infinite games uh, basically where this end is not in sight and your best strategy is like look for utilities for now. So what will work for me right now? And uh, yeah, so I will bring all this because in relation to like how would all this eventually relate to uh, let's say Falcon or, or whatever. And uh, we kind of want to think of of it as infinite games in the sense that we don't want Falcon to end, right? So uh, we want, uh, right? So we uh, so so we expect people to be getting good things for themselves alive, but not necessarily with an object of winning the game at the end of Falcon. Uh, uh, all right, so I, I promised to talk about crypto economics. So, what is what is crypto economics then, or, or what 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 should crypto economics do? Uh, uh, kind of. So, so how I understand this. So, uh, so, so what crypto economics should do is so we have incentives that could or sometimes are set to be temporary, like block reward, but we set it to disappear, and. Right, so, so, so we want to introduce this this temporary incentive, but thinking it will somehow uh, achieve a stable long term behavior that we want. Right, so people at random on the internet. Right, so, so let's say we first introduce like all the IPFS technology, right, and with this people can make uh, store data if they want, right, and and uh, and uh, right, so have strangers on the internet store data if I pay them. But they're not necessarily doing this, even if this would be a win for everyone and a good thing they could do. But we are like, let me push people to do this a bit. Let me introduce so, so, so kind of the the system of people with data on the internet has presumably two stable points. One where they're not making deals, and one where they are making deals. And hopefully these are, we know the non-making deal one is stable because like this is what people are doing, just not doing it. But we, we would hope that the other one is stable too. And so, so what crypto economics is good is to, it's a tool to introduce explicit symmetry breaking, right? To bridge gaps 
that could have been spontaneous symmetry breaking, but we were not where we wanted to be. So let's say these are two things that could happen. Like people could be making data deals or people could be not making them, but right now we are here. Uh, we want this to be stable because in the end we want to leave the system alone and then not to decay. So it would, it's a good idea to have a target in mind that is a stable target. But what we want to do is kind of nudge it that way. So here are into the economic incentives that introduce this uh, explicit symmetry breaking that make this a preferred stable point than this one. Right? And then we expect that, uh, okay, so we introduced this, this, this incentive for a while. And, uh, and so this is exactly how it works with the magnets also that, uh, okay, so you can, you are, it can be up oriented or down oriented. Uh, I can introduce a magnet to get it to be in the orientation of uh, I want an external, I can introduce an external field. But what I want is that when I remove the field, the magnet will stay there and that uh, right, so it will stay there because it was in an ordered phase that is small enough fluctuations around a stable point. But uh, yeah, so this is kind of what, uh, what, what, what I think this means for, uh, for crypto economics that we need, uh, yeah, some uh, what we should be aiming for are things that are stable points with small enough fluctuations around them, but that we are just currently not in them. And crypto economics can help us uh, not just towards that point that we want, but it's less hopeful that it will help us get to an artificial point that is not stable. I mean, that will be an example. So, okay, so I push everyone here. And then I let it go, and then it all crumbles, crumbles down. And so, uh, and so the desired behavior, which should incentivize, should be a stable point, uh, just not necessarily one that people would have chosen on their own. And right? uh, so here, it, so like presumably things that are stable is that it's presumably stable that we could have a market where where users pay for transactions fees to have their transactions written on a ledger because that's valuable. Right? Uh, right, so you would have block reward as this external magnetic field that pushes into this regime. And you would think if this is stable, you remove the magnetic field and people will remain doing that. And that's the, that's the goal here. Maybe that's reasonable. Uh, sounds like could be reasonable. To me, more questionably reasonable are these questions about, so, so some stable coins are kind of uh, relying on, on a network or, or questionable if they're relying on this network effects or not, right? So, so, uh, so you have coins that start by saying we have uh, our coins are one to one backed by fiat reserves, and this will push people to this desired behavior that they treat this fake internet token as if it was worth one dollar. Right? Now everyone is in this point where we all agree this fake token is worth one dollar, and we trade it. We don't accept any more or less than one dollar. We could, in principle, reduce the reserve because now we're in this point where people are trading it as such. And it is at least unclear if some stable points are doing that and to, one, to what extent, right? So like, uh, yeah, they claim they have it all backed up, but it's no longer backed up now. This is a stable point simply by interactions of people who now refuse to trade it at any other than, than a dollar, right? Uh, right, so this is so you kind of align everyone into this ordered phase where we pretend this is a dollar. Then you remove the magnetic field of the of the of the reserve, and you hope people keep trading it for a dollar. But it is questionable uh, how stable this is. And to this end, uh, just to touch on the last subject of like false vacuum decay, which is a, a thing in physics. Right, so this would be what this looks like. Like. Uh, so this is what the situation looks like when I distort it with my reward or with my uh, reserve or something. So it can be like, oh, so this is the, the stable point to treat this thing as $1. But then when I remove my reserve, I got people to be at this point, but, but, but my system without that external field actually looks like this, where people are here, but in a very precarious situation where a little bit of fluctuation can make them uh, all cascade down here, right? So uh, this might be the status of some uh, unbacked, uh, uh, unbacked uh, stable coins. That's my speculation here. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's it.
that's it. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Axel. Are there any questions? And you still have six minutes. <laughs> yeah, nice. I wasn't even looking at the time. <laughs> Axel is a pro at presenting. Okay. If there are oh, any questions? Well, what, yeah, one of the things I don't know, it's just kind of a comment. One of the things I was thinking about while you're talking, Axel, is like in in physics, right? Like your feedback to the whatever's happening is immediate because it's an electromagnetic field or uh you know a uh a, a, a gradient of uh in, in a chemical solution like you get feedback like oh i should move this way or swim this way because the concentration is forcing me that way so like you get that that immediate feedback and then now we're dealing trying to make this analogy into the economic space where people are are there and there's so many like blockers to that you kind of alluded to this like it's not the same thing like people a lot of time like if you don't have their attention they're they're not going to do it like maybe the roi changed dramatically due to some new stimulus but this person is they're investing in cosmos and ethereum and uh and filecoin and they've got different bots going and different contracts going and, and like you can't even get their attention until like whatever uh ramifications of that change have, have come and gone and and so like that you don't get that immediate feedback in an economic situation necessarily just due to due to like attention attention span and like the attention economy and so then like i was thinking like the intersection of ai will some of those things become more and more automated like we have so many things to think about as this economic agent can we outsource that to ai and become a little bit more like a, a, a physics particle so that we like react uh, more immediately well uh i mean so so the, this so there's several points here so so this concept of locality that i talk about is also like very related in physics to like speed of information right so so yeah i get information right away but from my closest neighbors faster and there's a limit to to how fast this information uh, travels and that's related right to the, to the way I so th this is actually something that is provable when you have a strong enough sense of locality in your model, then you can prove that there are some bounds on the speed that uh, that information uh, travels. But uh, here, uh, yes, so so and the thing I was mostly discussing, like there's no traveling information, right? Because it's just like me thinking alone here about my best strategy. But you can even so in the next, uh, in, like in this version that I also discuss, is also very simplistic. In the, so, this would still be like a one-shot game with coordinated premeditation. Right? So let's so let's all talk about the the strategy we will all do at once. I right? so the coordinate, and uh, okay, now we all put our cards and uh, we do it in a in a way that that we coordinated previously that will maximize our thing. But yeah, the questions you ask more will be more relevant in in things like this. So this is like, like so these are not one shot things, and and these are things where where we're so in an infinite game, there will be an active situation going on, and you will be getting information, presumably with locality as well. You will get information from your nearest neighbors sooner, and then depends what happens to then. Uh, uh, so, so this. Uh, so, so there should also be a notion of of speed of of traveling information. So, so I said that in that sense shouldn't be that different to the situation in in physics. Yeah. Nice. Do you have any like? I like that the, these frameworks. I think are really useful when we're thinking about economic problems. Are there any like? maybe you would have mentioned it in the talk are you thinking about applying these to any specific problems already or just kind of like hey this is a framework that i want to like share with the team i mean uh so the i mean the theories in me would like to like uh look at put so i can put some 
So, so there, I think there's a worthy exploration in like in the same level as easing model is worth in physics and like we find an example model that we put a, a simple function here and we can show this this different phenomena actually exist so so we can try like a simple model like this uh, we're gonna I was also even thinking like we can use this the easing model as a utility function right? so that that's one thing we can do where we have strategies that are up and down that we can if this is my utility I can use that to uh, Right, then put it in this formalism instead of a partition function and see if uh, if uh, if these things are, if if right, there's some simple ways to see phenomena like this uh right to kind of proof of concept of of this possible effect here uh that's that's something uh, like a, a toy project to to look at uh i mean so so one thing i i i take away from my from my little questions right here is, is to so, so this was inspired by actual lot of papers in different fields and a lot of so, so there's a lot of phenomenology when it's not justified there should be so like i say like you will see a paper of like oh we spotted this power loss in crypto economics this may hint at uh at uh at a critical phenomena and this and this and this gives us a way to understand this like is this something important or nonsense and it depends on on the context but uh yeah i mean i mean like there's already a lot of of work on like the critical theory uh, critical phenomena like theories of anything that is a complex system and a lot of it is unclear if it's meaningful or not so, so this is kind of where i'm going to say so if i read something about economics in the future i can be like does this make sense <laughs> this is kind of where, where where i'm going coming from perfect thank you axel um i think we are on time um so thank you so much for the presentation i will upload the recording to the notion page so everyone can can see it later and the next um seminar we have is on january 11th and it will be our own tom mellon presenting um so if you are curious just come back and uh, see this uh, presentation thank you so much everyone bye bye thanks Axel.